Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of Seeking Voices of Health, Healing, and Hope. I'm Dr. Monica Agarwal, cardiologist and preventive cardiologist focused on nutrition and lifestyle. I had the pleasure today of interviewing a pretty fabulous man, Dr. William Lee. He's a physician, scientist, best-selling author of Eat to Beat Disease, New York Science, the, sorry, The New Science of How Your Body Can Heal Itself, and Eat to Beat Your Diet, Burn Fat, Heal Your Metabolism, and Live Longer. Dr. Lee is an internationally renowned physician. He's a scientist. He's an author. He's done groundbreaking research that's led to the development of 30 new medical treatments that impact 70 diseases, including diabetes, blindness, heart disease, and obesity. He did a TED Talk called Can We Eat to Starve Cancer, which has garnered more than 11 million views. Dr. Lee has appeared on Good Morning America, CNN, CNBC, Rachel Ray, and Live with Kelly and Ryan. And he's been featured in USA Today, Time Magazine, The Atlantic, O Magazine, and so many more. His newest book, the New York Times bestseller, Eat to Beat Your Diet, Burn Fat, Heal Your Metabolism, and Live Longer, was released in March of 2023. I had the pleasure of reading it, and it was fun to ask Dr. Lee questions about his new book. Some of the things that we talk about are really the fat, the connotation and what fat is and why fat has a negative connotation. We talked about metabolism and what it means to have a slow and fast metabolism. We talked about acromancia, which is an interest to mine, which is a gut bug that he loves to talk about and I asked a lot of questions about. And we talked about leptin resistance, weight loss, longevity, so many different interesting topics. Such a pleasure to have Dr. Lee on my show and I hope you enjoy listening to him too. Uh, join us. So great to have you, Dr. Lee, on my podcast. I'm really excited to talk to you about your new book and about who you are. And after just having that nice conversation with you ahead of time, I'm just looking forward to having a cup of tea with you and sitting with you and having a chat. So well, thanks, uh, what Dr. I'd like to, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be on with you and you know, let's let's talk about the things that we're both interested in. I love that. So I thought maybe you could just tell the audience a little bit about yourself. You know, you've come from you and me. We've trained very similarly. We went to medical school. We did a lot of research. We were in academics for a long time. And sort of how did you go from being that guy to being that guy plus, which is educator, um, you know, educator probably is maybe a lecturer. You know, what would you say is your most exciting word to define yourself to and sort of how did you get here you know um so first of all thank you for um uh having me on and also uh you know i, I to talk about myself today i have to say i haven't really changed from who i started out being and that's something that really helps me um navigate sort of my divining rod of where i go and how i do things is i, I follow my instinct that i i had when i was a kid you know, I grew up with uh, one parent who was an artist, uh, a pianist, a musician, um, and another parent, my dad, uh, was a biomedical engineer. So he was in the science research. And so I always grew up um, loving science, but also being very creative by nature. Sometimes they clashed, but I would say more often than not, I use it to my advantage to navigate through high school, college, medical school, what have you, you know, because we can solve problems using logic and science um, equations, algorithms uh, often, but we can't solve all of them. In fact, many times we wind up realizing we don't know enough or we can't figure out our way through just by putting logic into something, whether it's a health problem or, or a math problem. Um, but what we do, what I always been able to do is then switch into creative mode, kind of into the other side of my brain and say, well, what if we were to just figure out our way around that problem, even without logic, how do we get arrive at the other side? So, <clears throat> so I'll tell you, I was a, I was a biochem major in college, love science, love the laboratory, but I also spent a lot of time um, in the studio arts lab. I took history of science, history of art. I was a history of man. I was fascinated by the Renaissance. And, the, and for me, what I was particularly interested in that I think does explain what, why I do what I do today is I love this idea that um, it was the dark ages, the middle ages, and then it was a renaissance, the age of enlightenment. 
And we think about those two periods way back, hundreds of years, you know, uh, really thousands of years, if you want to take a look at it that way. And the dark ages where, you know, people were uninformed and uneducated and they really didn't do things in a very sophisticated way. Um, and it seems like almost overnight the Renaissance occurred. And now you had Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel and all these wonderful scientific discoveries, the golden age all of a sudden occurred. But not so. That's not how it happened. What really happened is that a slow evolution of understanding, discovery, creativity, and science took place over hundreds of years. And where yesterday was the dark ages and tomorrow is the golden age of discovery. And that's where we still are today. You know, yes. so when you and I went to medical school, we were always um, taught that the stuff that you're learning is so amazing. You know, we now know how coronary plaques form. We now know how diabetes occurs. We now know this. There's always something new that we're being taught about. And oh yes, here's the latest FDA approved prescription drug. Look at what it can do. Or here's the latest procedure that is really cool. We learn at medical conferences. In reality, those are small incremental steps forward. And yesterday, you know, as of today, yesterday in the rear view mirror is still the dark ages and tomorrow through the windshield is still the future. So what I've always been excited to do is to say, you know, number one, how can I actually help develop better treatments in the future? So I've done a lot of biotechnology work uh, as a researcher and working through a nonprofit called the Androgenesis Foundation. But in so doing, what I realized is that, you know, we're still kind of in the dark ages because we're mm -hmm. not preventing disease at all. We're just chasing diseases with more expensive, fancier treatments that are not accessible to everyone with unknown side effects. I mean, look at the whole idea, even Ozempic repurposing the meds. We have no idea what's going to happen in the future to people that are, you know, using slash abusing, you know, uh, prescription weight loss drugs. And so I started to realize that, you know, the fundamental science that we use to develop biotechnology treatments, the control group or the pre-treatment group really is what we're looking for is healthy people. You know, all these pathways, immune immunotherapy, well, that's treating a sick immune system or trying to boost the immune system. But what, what was it like beforehand? Like we actually know a lot of information about that. Um, angiogenesis, blood vessel growth, a bad in cancer, insufficient in cardiac disease or in diabetes. Well, you know what? We actually know the body can control angiogenesis, blood vessel growth all by itself. Same deal with stem cells. Forget about the strip ball, which is not ready for prime time to get your knee injected or your shoulder injected. Um, you know, like the real stuff is coming in the future. Um, but, you know, Mother Nature actually created stem cells uh, in our body at birth. We still have 70 million stem cells running around us all day long. Um, what are the things that we can do with diet and lifestyle using the same sophisticated approach as drug development, but applying it not for treatment, but for prevention and applying it not for drugs or other technologies, but for the simplest thing that we all have to encounter that's equitable for you know most people around the world to survive is our food. And that's what really kind of brought me to where I am right now. It's kind of a, you know, I, I haven't thrown away the baby with the bathwater. I still believe in using the right medicine for the right patient at the right time. But what about this tool in the toolbox we've all forgotten, which is food as medicine? Oh, it's beautiful. You know, I, I really loved everything you just said there. So, you know, teasing it apart, I just think that it it's so um it's so beautiful. The, the reality is, is you're absolutely right. When we, when we all train, we learn to put out fires. We never learned how to prevent. I mean, that's sort of a big, the biggest thing. And the fact that many of us have shifted into this prevention space is so, so important. But what I liked about what you said is, is like the body is truly this beautiful gift, whether you're religious or not, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's such a gift. The fact that we have sweat glands when we overheat and that there's sweat that comes out of you, or that we have the ability when our blood vessels are clogged to build blood vessels around it, um, called collateral formation. You know, there, there's just so much there. And if you, you said it exactly right, that if you add back in some of the healthy, healthy processes like the right foods and the right lifestyle, you can allow your body to do what it naturally wants to do, which is heal and be better. And I think that that was beautiful. I think that was such a nice way to say it, which explains why you wrote these great books, one of which I have right here, 
which is eat to beat your diet, uh, burn fat, heal your metabolism and live longer. So thank you for that. And it's such a lovely book. Uh, I've read it and really enjoyed it. What do you think? Why thank did you. you write this book? Yeah. Why did you write this book? And what were you hoping to show people with this book? And maybe also speak to the book right before this, the eat to beat, uh, the other book with the eat to beat. <laughs> disease. Yeah. <laughs> yes, disease. So, so yeah, listen, I, I never set out to be an author. Um, you know, I, um, I'm a researcher, I'm a clinician, I'm always trying to figure out how to pull the rug of the future uh, closer to us faster. So that's really what I spent most of my time doing. But as I started to do more food as medicine research and discover that when you put foods into the same lab system, clinical systems that we use for drug development, and I started to see that as many as 50% of the foods that we were, I was testing were equal to or better than the potency of drugs that I was also developing and testing, I started to take this whole idea of nutrition in a way that, of course, we were never taught this in medical school because it was always laughed at. Nutrition was sort of, ah, uh, you just, mm -hmm. that's a different field altogether. But I started to realize there is the food as medicine part is every bit as sophisticated as the medicine, the pharmaceuticals as medicine. Um, in fact, it's sort of like from farm to pharma is a continuum because most of the drugs we actually use, uh, the common ones actually originally going back decades had their origins in natural sub sources anyway, like plants, right? Yeah. Chemo, aspirin, you name it. A lot of them were discovered in, in natural plants. So um, uh, one of the things that I wrote about in my first book, Eat to Beat Disease, um, uh, uh, I, I wrote it because food has immediacy. You and I could have a, coffee together and I could tell you about, or maybe you could tell me about some exciting uh, new heart drug that was being developed. And I can share with you what we're doing in regenerative medicine or cancer. And we would, you know, find it interesting. I'm sure I would learn a lot from you, but probably we couldn't, neither you nor I could put it in that information into use for years, maybe, maybe decades, maybe never, because, you know, the odds of failure for drug development are like 10,000 to one. Yeah. But if you and I exchange information about how tomatoes or how avocados could help our body's own hardwired health defense systems to improve our heart function, lower inflammation, and improve our circulation, um, that information that you told me I could put to work that night. And same yeah. thing if I gave you that. So the, the, what led me to write the book was this idea of immediacy that food as medicine has immediacy to the public. And so I felt like, okay, I'll go write that book. And, and little did I expect, but it became a New York Times bestseller. Um, and, uh, uh, and I started to teach a course, an online course, to now going on to 4,000 people around the world from 34 countries, you know, that are all learning about how the immediacy of food as medicine and how they can improve their own lives. Um, and then what I realized is that you know, when you write one successful book, your publisher gives you the privilege, uh, invites you to write another book. Uh, so I, I, I had another book, uh, which is what you showed, Eat to Beat Your Diet. And I honestly didn't know what I wanted to write about for a long time. Uh, then I realized I wanted to write a sequel. A sequel is just like in a movie, kind of building on the characters that you loved in the first movie and seeing <laughs> them again, facing a different threat and figuring out how they're gonna get out of that jam, uh, the new jam, the new dilemma, the new story, and seeing some new characters uh, 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 and having some good guys turn into bad guys and bad guys turn into good guys. You know, the best sequels out there like Godfather movies uh, or Star <laughs> Wars movies. And you see all this thing, Luke, I'm your father, you know, uh, uh, or, you know, Fredo winds up putting the hit on Michael Corleone. There's all these surprises in the sequel. So what I wanted to do was to write about those surprises that matter to our health. And where did those biggest surprises come from that are science-based, that everyone thinks they know something about, is in metabolism and diet and body fat. So I decided to write a sequel to my first book um, called Eat to Beat Your Diet. And the word diet is a trick word. It's a trick title, Eat to Beat Your Diet, not a diet book. In fact, it's an anti-diet book. And what I wrote about teaches, shares the real insight of how, if you understand how your body's really hardwired, you never really need to go on any of these strict 
uh, rigid diets if you want to be healthy. And if you want to actually, if you're one of those people that wants to fight body fat, doing it the ways that you hear about it on the internet or that, you know, you subscribe to these rigid things that are impossible to follow diets, that's not the way to do it. There's actually an enjoyable way to actually control your body fat. And if you're a super thin person, slender, you know, and you're like, you know what, I can eat anything I want. I'm never going to worry about um, my, my diet. I'm, I'm good. All right. Guess what? That assumption is also wrong because even thin people can have harmful amounts of internal body fat, visceral fat that can be critically dangerous for your for heart disease, for cancer, for a whole host of other diseases. And so what I try to do in this book is to reveal, kind of uncloak how the body is like the statue of David. You know, that famous statue in Italy that everybody admires as the epitome. Our body is truly amazing. And our body is able to run a metabolism that's hardwired and use fuel that we need, that we get from our food to be able to do it perfectly. And what happens is our behavior and our lifestyle and some of the exposures that we might have, um, those things derail. And so how do we get back to the, how do we get back to our inner selves is first by understanding how well our body wants to go by itself and then figuring out how to use food to get there. I love that. I really like that you explain that and you do such a great job in the book as well, explaining sort of the baseline, which I think a lot of books don't do. And I, I really appreciated that you did a nice job with that. So let me, let me fire off some questions about that because as yeah. I was reading and I thought, this is something we got to talk about this. Oh, this, we got to talk about Oh, wait, wait, this we got to talk about. So, but I thought maybe in the beginning, you start talking about metabolism and you say, you know, there's no really a such thing as a slow or a flat, you know, everyone you talk to patients, you talk to your family, you talk to, Oh, my metabolism, metabolism is really slowed down. That's why I can't eat so much. So is that really true? Is there such a thing as a slow or fast metabolism? And are we all victim to it? Yeah. So listen, metabolism is a word that everyone knows something about. You don't have to be a scientist. All you got to do is go onto Wikipedia and type up metabolism. And by the way, the Wikipedia definition is the same definition that you and I learned about in medical school, more or less. <laughs> it's a net sum of chemical reactions in the body that actually gives energy, energy to the cells for physiological function. Like that's what's in Wikipedia. That's what's in our textbooks that we learned. And yes, you know what? That is all true. But there's been some really, really amazing discoveries about metabolism just in the last two years that straighten out our misunderstandings and assumptions of metabolism that everyone thought they knew, including doctors, by the way, including me. So uh, let, let's start Let's start there for me to share uh, with your listeners and viewers um, something about metabolism. Okay, so um, most people carry around this common assumptions about metabolism. Um, number one, that we're either born with a fast metabolism or a slow metabolism. So the, the saying goes, oh, my sister was so lucky. She was born with a fast metabolism. Look how skinny she is. She can eat anything. And me, unfortunately, I was born with a slow metabolism. I've struggled with food my whole life. And that's why I struggle with my weight, right? So it's the luck of the draw, you know, something when you came out of your parent, your mother, like that's what, that you're, you're, you are blessed or cursed from birth. Okay. A second uh, uh, assumption is that if you had teenagers, all right, uh, you, you assume that when teenagers, like, you know, when they hit puberty, whether it's a boy or girl, they're eating two or three dinners, they're super active, they're bouncing off the walls, they're, they're growing uh, tall as a, as, as, a, as a tree, and you're assuming their metabolism is going up, right? Like nobody with that kind of energy could, be, you know, must be having a, a higher metabolism, right? Okay. Then you assume that when you hit um, your middle age, 40 or 50, Unfortunately, you're cursed just by your age and that when you hit middle age, whether you're a man or a woman, regardless of how you started out, your body shape is going to change because your metabolism is going to, you're going to be screwed by your age. Your age dictates your metabolism and when it starts to slow down, your body shape is going to change. Um, that's objective, not subjective. It's just going to change, right? And we see this in real life. And, and, and so, uh, and by the way, the other assumption is that when you have a slow metabolism, that's what leads you to grow extra body fat, all right? So you curse that slow metabolism. These are the assumptions, right? Well, they are yeah. all wrong. Every single one of those is incorrect. We are not born with, a, with um, different metabolism. We're all born with the same metabolism. 
uh, it's hardwired into our system, like our operating system or your laptop, it's the same metabolism and it works the same way. It makes total sense the same way that our taste buds work the same way when we're born. Our, um, our kidneys work the same when we're born. Uh, our thyroid gland works the same way when we're born. Why would we think that our metabolism is just going to be the roll of the dice? No, it is hardwired. And I'm going to tell you how we discovered this. Second is that, um, uh, oh, so I'll tell you. So the, the big discovery in 2021 was uh, uh, done by a 90 researchers led by a guy, a researcher named Herman Ponzer at Duke. They studied 6,000 humans across 20 countries, both sexes across the entire age range, starting from one week old to 90 hmm. plus years old, the entire human lifespan. And we're talking about North America, South America, Africa, all throughout Asia, China, Russia. I think the only country that wasn't covered was Antarctica because those people come from, you know, they're researchers anyway, from other places. And they studied them. Uh, they, they asked, what is their metabolism over the, over the course of their lifetime? And they studied the entire human lifespan metabolism to figure out what it is, in, you know, purposefully creating heterogeneity, meaning differences, including everybody, throwing everybody into the pot. But they studied them, the genius that they studied them in the same way. They studied them by giving them a glass of water. Gulp. All right. Now, the key thing about water is that water is H2O. Everyone knows that. H is hydrogen. O is oxygen. You could go in there and tweak the hydrogen and tweak the oxygen so that you can measure it. All right. And so when you drink water, your body will metabolize the hydrogen, the atoms, and the oxygen. And then you can measure those atoms in the breath in the bloodstream and out of your urine. That's what they did. And from that, they were able to calculate based on the age, based on the body, the height, the body size, everyone's metabolism, okay? In, in the 6,000 people across 20 countries um, uh, from one week old to 90 years old to figure out, the question was, what does human metabolism really look like when you throw everybody into the pot uh, over the, from, from one week old to 90 years old? That's an amazing question to ask. Study the same way and the initial result is wait for it all over the map drum roll okay. please <laughs> all of it all over the map okay metabolism was scattered everywhere it was just a the, the results looked like a gigantic like mess like a five-year-old just took a crayon and just scribbled all over the wall disappointing right wrong because we now live in the era of supercomputing so what they were able to do that was so clever they were able to go back and take a look at the height the age uh, the body uh, uh, composition and size of every one of these is 6,000 individuals. And they could, from the result, subtract, remove the effect of excess body fat. So they knew they were able to calculate how much body fat they should have. And they just removed it. The subtra subtraction one by one by one by one by one for 6,000 times. And you know what they found when they did that? All of a sudden, the pattern of human metabolism, when you remove the effect of excess body fat, became crystal clear. All humans are born with the same metabolism. All humans go through four phases of metabolism over the course of their lifetime, from one week old to 90 years old. And here's how it goes. We are all born the same way. In year one, our metabolism skyrockets. It's like a rocket going off. And, it, and at one year old, it's 50% higher, the baby's metabolism, compared to adults. All right. And by the way, that means that we're absorbing everything and, and as, as little babies, which is why it's so important to expose children to healthy things, not microplastics, not off gassing. Think about all the, the whoopies, the, the pacifiers with plastic rubbery stuff, the, you know, all that, uh, the, even the stuffed animals, you know, yeah. with the, the, the stuff that comes out that, that smells like a fresh stuffed animal. It's got off, off gassing. My gosh, we're beginning to realize that the metabolism is soaring. Uh, from zero to one, changes our view of pediatric kind of lifestyle and what their exposures. Phase two, that's phase one. Phase two is that during adolescence from age one to age 20, metabolism from that height goes down, 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 down to adult levels. So when the teenager is getting taller and bouncing off the wall and eating two meals, their metabolism is actually slowing to adult levels. Wow. That hmm. is really interesting because that's when breast form, gonads form, you know, de uh, development is going on. 
what's, you know, how does that work? We don't, you know, this research has opened more doors to more questions to answer. Um, that's so is interesting for research. Now, here's the phase three after adolescence is from age 20 to 60. Guess what they found? When you remove the effect of excess body fat, our, it turns out our bodies are hardwired to have rock stable metabolism from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60. Our metabolism is hardwired not to change, not mm -hmm. to change. All right. And then from 60 on to 90, you got about a 17% decline. By the time you're 90, your metabolism does slow with, you know, the, in your ninth decade, decade, about 20, only 17, 17% lower than it was when you were 60, which means that 17% lower than when you were 20. Okay. Now, remember what I told you, you only got this by removing the effect of excess body excess fat. Body. What happens when you throw excess body fat back into the equation? Metabolism crushes, gets crushed. So it's not that a slow metabolism causes you to gain extra body fat. It's extra body fat fits on your operating system and slows it down. It's like downloading too much stuff and having viruses accumulate uh, on, your, on your operating system and your laptop. Your whole operating system slows down. But when you remove the viruses, guess what? The operating system goes back to speed. Amazing discovery that helps us realize that we can take control of our metabolism. Our metabolism's not our fate. By understanding how we're hardwired at every phase of our human development, there's something we can do about it. And it's not that a slow metabolism causes us to gain extra body fat. It's the other way around. Extra body fat slows our metabolism down. Now we are in a driver's seat because there are ways that we can actually command and control excess body fat. And the big surprise that I wrote about in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is that you can do it not by removing food, not by elimination, restriction, um, and deprivation, but you can eat it by deliberately choosing certain kinds of foods that activate your body's system to optimize your metabolism, burn down harmful body fat, and allow your inner hardwiring to actually rise to the surface. So this is actually in all of our control. Mm, beautiful. So, you know, to recap it, it's so metabolism, one word that we all hear and know regularly, really doesn't change. It, there are four phases and, and we go through, all of us go through, through the same four phases, but we're all the same. We all go through those same four phases. Our metabolism is the same for all, is all of us. There's no when I hit menopause, my metabolism changed, or when I hit this age, my meta my metabolism well, changed. Well, well, actually, so so let me kind of tell you because we do see changes in body shape, we do see changes in uh, metabolism. What's actually happening? What I'm saying to you is that our when we come out of the box, just like a laptop that you buy at a computer store, coming out of the box, you charge it up, you boot it up. If I bought one and you bought one from where same. you live and where I live, it, the operating system worked the same way. We take care of our computer; um, it'll actually work the same way over the court, the life of the computer. Now what happens is that um, as computers age and get the wears and tears of life and how I treat my laptop and how you treat your laptop, um, oops, I just spilled some water on my laptop, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, I dropped it. What the behavior, the life experiences can actually alter what happens to the hardwire. So for example, mm -hmm. menopause, clearly changes in hormones actually change uh, brain uh, 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 function, which change behavior, which change uh, our, uh, our reaching, our, our food behaviors and our exercise behaviors. And by the way, generically speaking, what happens during middle age, you know, whether you're, uh, regardless of your gender, okay, uh, whether you're a man or a woman, look, um, when we're 40, okay, uh, our lives, our bodies are different, but our lives are also different. We are worried about different things. We've got different kinds of stresses than we were when we were 20, right? 20, the world is blue, the sky is blue. It's always, it's exciting. Everything is, you know, we work a little harder. We are well, we mean towards a brighter future. At 40 and 50, we're worried about our marriage. We're worried about our job. We're worried about the economy. We're worried about the war. We're worried about the pandemic. We're worried about something. And all that stress impacts our body's ability to um, uh, manage its body fat. We actually grow more body fat. Stress causes us to eat and behave and make less healthy choices. And every little bit that we grow extra body fat contributes to sitting on our metabolism. And, you know, and so I think menopause causes a big change. Life stressors uh, cause a big change. Um, you know, we, we just all went through 
like the entire planet, every human alive went through this gigantic stress three years, three years ago, um, you know, during the, the big shutdown. I mean, all those things alter our behavior and change. And, and that does affect our metabolism. That's like spilling water on your laptop. Okay. I think that, 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 that's helpful. So, you know, it's suggesting that, you know, we, we do, we don't live in a bubble. And so those other effects, the things that happen to us, our environmental exposures, our high levels of stress, excess body fat, all of these things are the things that are going to impact our metabolism. So you said though, that there are, we don't have to really worry about maybe restricting our diet, although some restriction is probably worthwhile. Uh, but there are certain foods that we can eat in our diet that can improve our help us reduce that excess mass or excess fat that we accumulate. What are a few of those foods that could you share with us? Yeah. Well, look, um, uh, so, uh, you just said something really important. And before I talk about which foods are good for our metabolism and burn body fat, let me just first say our metabolism uh, is uh, the way our metabolism works is like the way that a car that we drive every day um, uh, operates. And what do we mean by that? Well, you know, when you get into your car to go to work or go to school or go grocery shopping, um, what do you do? You, you know, you know that you are going to head someplace. You get in your car, you start it up, and you drive it. You're not thinking one bit about the, how the car actually operates. You're just on your, you're just on your way to get to your final destination, right? The only, but it's using fuel, and that fuel is being processed in a very specific way. And similarly, our metabolism is how our body is like a car that uses fuel. To drive that turns into energy to be able to drive the chassis of our body the same way that gasoline in our fuel tank drives our car to get from point A to point B. We don't think about it in a car usually. We don't think about it in our body usually. Okay. The only time that in a car we think about fuel and we think about you know um, uh, 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 the, the the consequences of of not having enough fuel um, is when the gas gauge reads low. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the only time when you see the gas gauge is low. What do you do? Instinctively, we figure out, let's pull over to the gas station. Let's go find the nearest gas station and fill up. And filling up with a gas tank, you put the thing in the nozzle, sprays in the gas, the gas tank fills up, you hear click. All right, by the way, you got to turn off your car at the gas station. Um, <laughs> uh, so you're not burning fuel when you're filling it up. I'm going to come back to you. You're going to see why this matters with metabolism. Yeah. And, and so then you're filling up the gas tank. It goes click, no more gas. Thank goodness there's no more gas because if there's no click, it would run out of the tank, spill down the side of the car, run your shoes, and you'd be standing in a flammable mess. Very, very dangerous. So the click is important. No more gas. Put it back. Now, you don't think about the fuel anymore. You know you've got a full load, and you get back in the car and drive up. Now, here's how it works in a body. If I told you your body operates, the metabolism operates just like a car does. All right. The, the, our body is like an engine. And it drives us around. We get around. The fuel that we need to run that engine is um, uh, food. The food gives us a fuel. The fuel isn't measured in gallons of gasoline like we have at the petrol station. And it's also not you know, electrical millihertz like we would actually have um, uh, if you have an electric car. But our fuel for our body is, has a different name. It's called calories. So I, I, you know, the reason I didn't bring this up first, um, Dr. Agarwal, is because people tend to the word calories is a loaded topic, loaded word. Yes. Uh, now yes. I'm actually now I'm actually putting it out there. Calories is just what we call, you know, the gallons of fuel. This is calories of fuel in our body. And so where do we get our fuel from? The food that we eat. Now, our body's hardwired so that when just like a car, our fuel ga gauge is low, our fuel is low, we don't have enough energy, we're low running low in energy, our brains send a signal to us um, that, hey, you know what's time to fill up, right? And what do we do? Just like in a car, we pull over to not the filling station, we pull over to the pantry, the refrigerator, go to the restaurant. And we tend to do that three times a day, sometimes more, because we need to fill up our tank. When we fill up our tank, and now we're going to talk about uh, two things. Number one, we don't have the clicker like a gas nozzle does. All right, we can keep filling up the tank, right? So in a car, it's a metal tank, there's a clicker, so you don't wind up turning in your, the gas station into a dan dangerous, you know, toxic, flammable mess, but we can keep adding fuel into our bodies. Keep on eating, keep on eating. You're watching the game and you just keep on stuffing stuff in your mouth. You can easily 
overflow your tank, fill your tanks, because the tanks that hold the energy is body fat, adipose tissue. And when our fat cells are full, our body has this incredible resiliency. It makes more fuel tanks, makes more fat. Keep on eating, fill up more fat. More, oh, still eating, make some more fat. You do this day in and day out, week in and week out. You're going to get fat because you're fat, you're growing body fat, you're just storing up fuel. All right. So that's one thing is the volume of food it does matter. I'm not saying that you should eliminate or restrict food, but you should eat intentionally and eat modestly or moderately um, uh, so that you're not overflowing your tank every single time you're at the filling station of the table, okay? Now, that's one thing. So behavior and not overeating is really important. Second is just like you're at the gas tank, the quality of the food, of the fuel of the food matters. If you have a car and you go to the gas station and you're like, eh, you know what? My bank account's a little low. I'm not gonna get paid for a few weeks. I'm gonna just, this time I'm just gonna put some cheap fuel in. Your car's not gonna be damaged at all. Well, right? you, can put in, you can put some crappy fuel in there once or twice. You're not going to notice the difference. Your car's not going to know the difference. But if you're one of those people, uh, a cheapskate, and you're going to deliberately pour the poorest quality fuel in your car from the get-go, year, week after week, month after month, year after year, guarantee you, your car's not going to run as long or as well as somebody who chooses to put a higher quality fuel into their tank. Makes total sense, right? Like we, we all know mm -hmm. this. Same deal as our body, the fuel we put in our body, the quality of that fuel matters. So again, not to, you know, deliberately, I didn't pull out the, the C word, the other C word is that, you know, a calorie is that, you know, when you hear about um, uh, not all calories are equal. True. Not all foods equal. You know, the amount of calories you have in a, in a, in a Snickers bar is different than the amount of calories you have in a salad, you know, or, or, or an avocado. All right. Yeah. Uh, the quality is different. So the I mean, the amount might be the same, but the quality is different because the plant based food um, uh, contains so many other micronutrients, uh, vitamins, minerals, bioactives, dietary fiber, insoluble fiber, things that activate our body's health defenses, things that improve our metabolism, things that actually activate our body fat to, uh, to uh, help us burn down harmful body fat. So this is where the quality of the fuel matters. And, you know, we can talk about, um, you know, how do you, so you cut down the, quanti the quantity of food you eat, and then you want to actually choose the quality of the food you eat. And most of them are actually plant-based foods. Okay. You've piqued my interest. And what are those foods? What, like if there are five foods that you would recommend, because, you know, everybody in society, I feel like always wants the five top things you can do, or, and I always like, whoa, whoa, wait, hold on. It's, it's not about five things. And I always emphasize to people that we really want you to eat a biodiverse set of foods, yeah. lots of, yeah. you know, very important to eat lots of different things. And, um, but you know, people really always want to hear five things. So uh, let's, let's humor the audience. Who's going to ask for five things that they can do and eat. Sure. I'm going to tell you five things, but I will also tell you, I want you to know where those five things come from. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a very, you know, I'm going to give you my personal view that's informed by my research and the data that's out there. First, you know, what kind of diet am I, am I on? None. I don't go with diets. Um, diets tend to be unsustainable. They're very different for every individual. One size doesn't fit all. So I tell people, first of all, I don't go on a diet. However, I do have a way, a method of eating, an approach. And my approach is called Mediterranean eating because I love in, inherently, I, I did a gap year uh, in the Mediterranean before I went to medical school. I have an Asian background. So the way the foods I normally gravitate towards, whether I'm cooking, meal planning, going to a restaurant, I'm at a buffet, I'm always looking for the Mediterranean choices. Okay. Yeah. So that should tell you something about where the five foods are going to come from, because those food cultures, um, not only are they the, among the tastiest food cultures, in, in the world. They're also among the healthiest food cultures in the world, the traditional Mediterranean diet, traditional Asian diets, regardless of where they're coming from. So um, so some of the things that I would tell you if, if I had to bring five foods with me to a desert island or you know on a, on a boat to have along, I would tell you um, I would take um, green tea with me and I would take coffee with me. Both of them um, are 
beverages. They're not food. So if you want to go, we can go to seven if you want. But they are both incre- the, the data um, uh, all shows that drinking coffee and tea in their pure form. Okay. okay so all unadulterated, um, no milk and sugar. No milk and sugar. None of the pumpkin flavor that you go at the drive through at certain times of the year. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, go for the straight stuff. It, it activates your body's processes. It helps your, it slows down cellular aging. It lowers inflammation, improves your circulation, um, uh, in, and enhances your immunity. Uh, you know, uh, helps your gut health. All of the things that are really important for long-term health, and they're also part of culture to drink, uh, to have a beverage in a healthy way. Some of the other foods I would actually tell you um, that I happen to love, you know, I love tomatoes. I love fresh tomatoes. I like dried tomatoes. I like stewed tomatoes. Um, uh, There's lots of different ways. We can talk separately at some point about the myth about the tomato as nightshade. That's all urban legend. Okay. Agree. Like, agree. Anybody, that anybody crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I always tell people, look, if I don't have time to talk about, you know, why that's an urban religion, I'm just going to tell you, push the button to flush it down that, that whole idea down the toilet. It, it's, it's trash. It's crap. So tomatoes are good. They have bioactives, carotenoids. They've got vitamin C. They are really great, tasty ways. Who doesn't like to go into an Italian or a Spanish restaurant or a recipe and to pick something that's made with a tomato? It's so diverse, so beautiful. Uh, and in the wintertime, when you don't have fresh tomatoes, have it sun-dried, have it a, a powder, or have it a paste. It's just absolutely delicious. That's one of them. I would actually also get tree nuts. I love tree nuts as a category. Walnuts, almonds, pecans, macadamias, pine nuts. Great source of plant-based omega-3s. Great source of dietary fiber. Great source of protein. Okay, I like people all to hear good. that last one. I'd like people to hear that, that last one, that it's a great source of protein as well, uh, because I think people forget that. Yeah. I mean, and a very important um, a source of protein, because, you know, um, especially as we get older, uh, you know, as we age, among the, all the things that I could tell you that would be like, people come up with all these fancy things they can do for aging, you know, sitting in a, you know, uh, uh, in an infrared uh, sauna, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you, the simplest Just thing I can tell protein. you, eat more protein yeah. and stay active. And those two things will make much more headway for you. Like you need, that'll put wind in your sail. Okay. You know, um, so and, and now that you brought up protein, I, you know, I like people to hear that as we get older, especially for seniors, that we really should be eating almost a gram per kig. Um, and sometimes some people even argue 1.2 grams per kig. So I think that people are not appreciating how low in protein they are getting as they're getting older. And especially at a time when each calorie counts, right? You're, you know, you don't want to eat as much food. And so just getting in blind calories and not getting the protein uh, is filling your stomach, but not giving you the protein. So just to sort of highlight that. Right. Well, listen, so uh, I said, tea and coffee, tomatoes, uh, tree nuts, which is diverse, uh, the whole diverse thing, beautiful uh, 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 spread. You can have it as part of a meal. You can sprinkle it onto a salad. I like to cook. So I like to talk about all this stuff. You can make it into a trail mix, you know, a healthy trail mix. So it's got, it's versatile, which is important and it's diverse. The other thing is actually kind of a related idea, great source of protein, great source of uh, uh, minerals, great source of dietary fiber are legumes. Mm -hmm. Legumes like edamame, soy protein. We can talk about that myth of soy also drives me crazy. Push the button, flush it down. Um, But also um, beans, Beans. white beans, uh, uh, black beans, you know, uh, you name it. Beans um, are one of the common denominator foods of all the blue zones. Um, Dan Buettner, who's one of the, you know, big proponents and champions of the blue zones, he was telling me about this. He's a friend of mine. And we were talking about that. I said, just tell me what the common denominator is in all these places where people live long and live well. And he's like, you know what? Actually, it's just beans. Every, every one of these cultures and every one of these locations, they eat a lot of beans. So I think that beans are great because you can store them. They're very inexpensive. You can keep them in your pantry. And you probably it's a good idea to soak them as a way of cooking them. You actually neutralize some of the phytic acid and all this other kind of stuff that's in there. And it makes it a lot faster to cook the next day. Beans are also great, by the way, because when you make a bean dish, you'll usually make enough that you can actually have as leftovers. So now you're yeah. saving money and time, right? That's a, that's important. And then, you know, I, I would say, then I actually love leafy green vegetables. That would be probably the last thing that I would actually uh, say. 
Um, actually, I got one more, but you know, like the whole family of leafy greens. I, and look, um, I do like kale, but I, I'm, I don't like to wave kale around. I love Swiss chard. Uh, you know, uh, I, I love um, different other, I love to experiment with different types of leafy greens uh, 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 and try them, uh, try them out. By the way, you know, I, I learned something. I was doing research in the Mediterranean and the markets um, in the Mediterranean this summer. And I learned that uh, the, um, uh, the anthocyanins, which are found in blueberries, which would be my other food that I would love to put on my list. I think I owed seven to you because two are beverages. But the anthocyanins, <laughs> which are so healthy in blueberries, improve your immunity, lower inflammation. They are also present in red lettuce. Mm. So if you go to the market and you look at the different kinds of lettuces out there, like iceberg is the stuff we grew up with. And you know, our lunch lady served that at school, not very particularly interesting, but there's red lettuce as well. And red lettuce also has uh, 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 these anthocyanins. anthocyanins. And so, so what's really wonderful is that colorful foods, you know, the people are right. Colorful foods tell us something about delicious. So I just think about the things I talked about, nuts, tomatoes, colorful beans, um, you know, they're, they're all great. Now, I also love fruit, but you only gave me five. So, and I gave you seven, uh, but we can keep on going in my, by the way, my first book, I wrote about, uh, I wrote about 200 foods that activate your body's health defenses. Um, and then I wrote about a hundred foods uh, in Eat to Beat Your Diet. So all my books have all these huge lists uh, that are out there. And I teach courses with downloads and, and you can actually have the list of foods. Um, and the other thing that I have in my book, as well as um, I teach in my course, is food doses. Mm. That's also important. Not only do we are we beginning to understand what foods are good for us and what's in them that's good for us, we're just beginning to figure out how much you should eat to get a good effect as well. Well, I would I have like 50 questions that I wrote down to ask you, and I it's not gonna happen today because you're such a wealth of information, such interesting things. I guess if I were to ask one last question, I would love to, and then I'll just have to come you have you come back if you'd ever uh, join me yeah, again. Yeah, love to. Uh, I think if the one question, and this is a little bit off topic, I guess, because but it's something that I was fa uh, fascinated about when you talked about when we met in Lake Nona, and it's about acromancia musophilia, 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 right? And so it's the gut bug, and so we didn't really talk about the gut uh, too much and the role of diet in terms of, the, of gut and short chain fatty acids. In mm -hmm. particular, you talk about this bug in your book and when we met. And I just thought if we could even just spend a few minutes on that before we close, I would love that. Yeah. Okay. So one of our body's health defenses, one of the most important ones, <clears throat> is our gut microbiome, which really re is responsible for our gut health, right? So this is now a concept that almost everyone has heard about. You want to have good gut health. What does that mean? Good gut health, well, actually, medically speaking, as you know, there's a lot of components to having a healthy gut. But what we're more usually referring to when you hear about it uh, at the popular topic, it has to do with having a good, healthy gut microbiome. Microbiome is just a fancy word that talks about healthy gut bacteria. Uh, well, it can be unhealthy, but you want it to be healthy. And when I say healthy, um, I'm talking about not like, you know, a, a few bacteria. I'm talking about 39 trillion bacteria. So there's, and, and, it's, and there's so many, by the way, that um, they're about one to one to human cells. Uh, they used to think there were a lot more bacteria than human cells. Actually, it's, it's about one to one. It's the latest calculation. But here's the thing. Our healthy gut bacteria are like the residents of a coral reef. So if you think about the most like amazing coral analogy. reef, yeah. if you think about the most amazing coral reef in the world, it's the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, yeah. right? You can see it from outer space. You go there. I, I've actually been, I've had the privilege of actually seeing the Great Barrier Reef because I, yeah, um, I went out there to, to um, I wanted to see it before, uh, you know, all the damage was occurring due to climate. And um, it's amazing. You get underwater. If you've seen it as well, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The diversity, the myriad sea life there uh, is mind blowing. It's staggering. And the same, similarly, in our gut, they, there are this myriad of healthy organisms, healthy bacteria, not just bacteria, also viruses and fungi and, and archaea, which is a whole other species that's out there. And they're just like in the Great Barrier Reef. They're all collaborating. They're coexisting. They're working together. So the health of the reef 
of the Great Barrier Reef is due to the diversity of the organisms. You start throwing new guys in there, you start killing off a few good guys, all of a sudden the ecosystem shifts, you know. And so same deal in our bodies. When we actually have unhealthy gut, um, our, it means it tells us something that our ecosystem is not so healthy. And, and the key thing about this is our gut bacteria lowers inflammation, boosts our immune system, and even uh, and streamlines our metabolism, okay? Uh, uh, text messages our brain for our emotional and mental health, but also fights cancer. So Amazing, right? this is maybe where I, um, uh, you and I had the conversation about acromancia. Um, a, a few years ago, a bombshell uh, scientific discovery was uh, uh, announced by a colleague of mine, Dr. Laurence Zipfogel out of, um, uh, out of Paris, who's a cancer researcher. She found that in cancer patients, 200 cancer patients, different cancers who were treated with immunotherapy. This is a treatment that the most natural treatment in the world, it doesn't, it's not chemo, just wakes up your own immune system to go search out and destroy cancer cells. It's what we all want, right? It's what actually happens normally in our body. Um, uh, and, and this is the type of treatment that has a potential for curing your cancer. It's so amazing. Um, but only 20% of people respond. 80% of people don't respond. Man, did that suck. And, and for a long time, we had no idea why that was occurring. Why is it some people have this remarkable response and some other people like just are like, it, it, it's like a, like a dud. All right. And it turns out that when Dr. Zitvogel did the detailed analysis, the difference between uh, responders or non-responders, people that lived or people that died, life and death, happened to be due to one bacteria that happened to be in the people who responded, who lived, okay? And that bacteria was identified called Acromancia mucinophila. Now, okay, sounds fancy, right? Acromancia mucinophila. I, I wanna, for people listening, this is how scientists talk about biologists, okay? First name, last name. First name's Acromancia, last name's mucinophila, all right? Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a Greek, a fancy Greek name. Um, and, um, but the key thing, it's a genus and a species. And this is one of a growing number of important healthy gut bacteria that we're beginning to discover that if you have it, you need to have it in order to stay healthy. Lactobacillus ruteri is another one. Bifidobacteria is another one. Lactobacillus plantarum is another one. We're beginning to discover these things one by one, okay? Early days yet, but we know that acromancy is really important to help you build your immune system so that you can respond to cancer treatment with immunotherapy. That is a life or death difference. How many, how many patients who have cancer go to their oncologist after they hear about their diagnosis and the treatments they're gonna to have to have? How many patients have I heard, and maybe you, have said, okay, doc, you know, um, I, I get it, I get it. I got cancer, I gotta get treatment, I gotta get chemo or, or whatever. Um, what should I eat, right? And the response that most oncologists until recently, almost every oncologist would say, eh, eat whatever you want. Just get enough protein. Yeah. yeah. doesn't matter. You know, enjoy yourself. You know, this is going to be the last few meals you're going to have in your life. Look, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. We now know you want to actually have a diverse plant-based, high soluble fiber diet with as many prebiotic polyphenols as possible, plus fermented foods. All right. You mm -hmm. want to stay away from soda. You want to stay away from with sugar, including artificial sweeteners, and you want to stay away from artificial preservatives, colorings, flavorings, okay? All of those things that are so common around us. And so the answer is just becoming obvious. If you're a cancer patient, you want to actually grow your acromancia. All right, so how do you do that? This is where food as medicine researchers like me are coming in. We do know that certain foods like pomegranates contain elagitanins. Elagitanins help your gut grow acromantia. So does cranberries and cranberry juice, pure cranberry juice, so unsweetened. So does Concord grape juice. So mm -hmm. if you are listening to this and you wanna try it out, look, um, they're, they're, don't drink too much of it. You don't need very much of it either. Pomegranate juice is pretty sweet, very sweet. But to grow acromantia, you only need eight fluid ounces a day, two shot glasses worth. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll start, start your acromantia growing. You can now order it as a dietary supplement um, as well. Cranberry juice, look at the bottle, look at the ingredients, make sure it's pure cranberry or pure pomegranate or pure Concord grape. 
So many beverages out there have added sugar. Mm. Stay away from that if you're a cancer patient because the sugar also changes the gut microbiome uh, as well. And artificial sweeteners are poison to the gut microbiome. So again, this is where we're going with gut health. This is where we're going with uh, acromancia. And I can tell you, um, and I'll, maybe this is not intended to end our, this podcast as a cliffhanger, but I promise to come back if you'll have me. Um, oh, love it. That, that as, of, as of today, you know, my research work and what we're, we're doing to figure out health cancer patients, there are at least nine bacteria that you want to be able to preserve in your gut that you can actually measure, you know, by looking at the gut microbiome to see if you have it or not. They seem to be critical for responders, the good responders to cancer immunotherapy. So, you know, this is a super exciting uh, way. Um, and I think that it, it really underscores for anybody listening, look, we're not just like talking about go, go go to the salad bar. We're saying that you can eat diversely. I told you, you can eat the Mediterranean style, delicious foods, um, don't eat too much and think about your gut and your gut health because it, it can make the difference between health and disease and even life and death. Mm, I love that. You know, I think the most important thing is, you know, to highlight. So, I mean, yes, having you back on is like a no, uh, non, like, yes, yes. But, um, you know, I think the thing that I love is, is that you're focusing on gut diversity uh, as the first and foremost, which comes mm. from eating a wide variety of foods. And then, then focusing on a few certain bacteria by adding in and supplementing a few different types of foods is very appropriate. And, you know, you brought up, uh, Conquered grape juice, you brought pomegranate juice, cranberry juice, or or the whole food, which is always mm. great. Um, and adding in those foods, which also give you the fibers and the other nutrients, is a great way to build up those healthy gut bugs. So I, I love that. And if you are if you're suffering from chronic illness in particular, as you know, I have rheumatoid arthritis, I'm constantly aware of my gut and my gut flora and what I'm putting in that's going to create those healthy bugs, that's going to decrease inflammation. And so I love that they, you've sort of highlighted that the key is diversity, eat lots of healthy plant-based foods. And then if you want to add in a few of these or a few of those, you're going to make it even a little bit better. So I think that's really great. Dr. William Lee, fabulous, uh, super smart, so well spoken, so much to talk about. I loved it. I love just chatting with you ahead of time. I love your book, uh, Eat to Beat uh, Your Diet. Um, and you know, the earlier book, Eat to Beat Your Disease, which I love. Pick them up on Amazon, pick them up um, anywhere that you get your books from. Uh, all of that information is in the show notes. It's such a pleasure to see you and thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to speak with you. Hi, this is Monica. I hope you enjoyed the podcast as much as I did recording it. If you're looking for additional opportunities to take control of your health, check out one of my online workshops where you can take a deep dive into concrete steps to foster change. Visit askmonica.me slash workshops. That's askmonica.me slash workshops to learn more. If you're looking for more specific advice for your own personal medical condition, I offer telehealth visits where we discuss your personal concerns and create an individualized plan. Find all the details at askmonica.me slash visit. That's askmonica.me slash visit. Thank you for joining and be well.